Well, hey guys, in today's episode, I want to do something a little bit different. I'm actually going to interview a video production company owner and a client and a friend. Um, ben Baldwin runs Chuff Productions in the UK. And Ben is someone who has been working with me for about two years. But I think what's interesting about this conversation is he really talks about where he was two years ago, how he navigated the whole COVID thing, and how he's now on target to beat all of his previous estimates in terms of revenue by simply following the process that we teach and share inside the VBA. And why I wanted to get Ben on was because he's someone who I think a lot of you watching or listening to this will relate to. In this conversation, we talk about everything from how he got his break into video production, because I think that's always a really interesting thing to explore, how different people got into the industry, and also where he sets his sights on in the next 12 months. So I think you'll find this really super helpful, so let's just jump straight into it. Well, g'day Benjamin, it's so good to finally have you uh, sitting in the seat. I think we've tried to do this podcast for almost a year maybe, um, but for various reasons, um, children, lockdowns, COVIDs, and all that fun stuff, we are here finally. And what I wanted to do today was just share with the listeners and the viewers, you know, cool stories of people's journey in video production, how you got to where you got to today, what you're doing now, but actually starting way back at, wh where did you first start getting into all this video stuff? And, and, and I know from speaking to you that you didn't start as a video producer. So welcome to the show and just tell me your story. I'd love to hear how you got into this crazy world of video. Uh, well, first of all, uh, Dennis of the Clan Lenny, thank you very much. It is an absolute pleasure to be on the podcast, having listened to every single episode, some of them more than once. And uh, yes, all those things above, but but we're here. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a, everyone thinks they're unique. I'm different because uh, I, Video production was never really in my sort of eye line, in my ballpark. If it went, go all the way back to school and all I wanted to be was an actor. And so that was the ambition. I went to drama school and realized how fierce the competition was to be a professional actor and just how amazing some of my peers around me were. Um, uh, so I'd always kind of wanted to be, you know, on actor actor presenter maybe uh perhaps radio dj or something like that and um so yeah the first path what took me to drama school when i came out of there um didn't like resting didn't like not having any money uh so moved very quickly as a lot of actors did into uh promo work so on trade stuff so uh you know whether it was fags or booze or food or whatever it was that kind of stuff um promoting those uh, and, and along the way, somehow I ended up finding myself with a, with a camera and shooting some of that stuff and editing it and, and selling it back to the client just as kind of a little bit of fun. But when I really got in, into it was I, I had a friend who was a uh, he was a presenter who was doing a bunch of travel programs and needed a PA, uh, someone just to go with the crew. PA, VA, a production assistant, basically drive the car. We're talking DigiB today. So it was the, the crew of four, presenter, camera op, um, sound, and, and me just driving around stupidly fast in a Ford Galaxy, getting people from place to place. And that's where I was kind of like, before that I'd wanted to present. So I've been doing some stuff on, on uh, a little known channel called QVC. Uh, and from there, uh, basically took the we, it, Digibeta, I had a tape and everywhere we went, if we got a bit of time, the tape went in the camera and I did a piece to camera. And that eventually got me in front of camera, uh, having gone through sound. Uh, so basically the camera guy, his sound guy couldn't do a week on the next thing. He's like, I'm going to teach you how to use an SQN and I'm going to teach you how to do sound. So that was a great pay bump from like 250 quid a week to 650 quid a week. And then obviously wanted to get in front of the camera. So Learned from there, did a load of travel programs to cut a very long story short, then ended up uh, working for Sky and for ITV on their revenue generator channel. So if you came in late night, pissed up from the pub, you'd probably see me on, on screen going, hey, what's the answer? And you can win 40 grand. Um, so that in itself kind of taught, well, for some people, it, it you get painted with a brush of oil. You can only do the revenue generated stuff as a presenter. 
at the same time, I was still doing some corporate presenting trade shows where we bumped into each other a few times. And uh, uh, yeah, <clears throat> went from there basically, built, built the, the video side of it. Um, B2B marketing kind of videos, testimonials, picking up anything I could, doing jobs for the likes of uh, new tech for their testimonial videos. And testimony videos is kind of where we found our sweet spot. So, I mean, like like many people on their video journey, you know, um, they fall into it. What what was yeah. the point at which you went, right, I'm actually going to gonna turn this into a business now. Like, this is actually going to be my main focus. Can you remember that moment and, and what you went through? What changed? I mean, was, was there a big aha moment or was it more of a kind of like looking back retrospectively? You're like, oh, actually, I guess that was the point. I'd love to know how, how that evolved. Yeah, for, for me, it was probably the, the the killing of my presenting career that seemed to kind of happen. And that was so, as I say, having come from these revenue generators, so we're, we're talking um, roulette and, uh, you know, quiz games for big money, like late night TV. So I was, you know, late night ITV won for about 18 months. Um, and when that show finished and all those kind of shows finished, it was a bit like, oh, well, they did that kind of presenting, so I'm not sure they can do anything else. But I'm I've got thousands of live TV flying hours unscripted sort of under my belt. And I was a bit like, probably just need to go and do something else for a little bit, still keep my hand in uh, with the presenting. And the, the natural thing just to seem to be go towards the video production because I was doing these trade shows. I would, I got, and what was weird, I guess, about it was, it was, uh, look, we all blag to get where we want to do, don't we? Some of us are still, still blagging and, you need a good blag sometimes just to get your foot in the door with a certain client. And that was kind of it. I, I think there was a couple of jobs where I was like, yeah, we could do that. No problem. And then went away and probably watched a, a video by yourself or someone like yourself going, oh, how do we do this? And how does that kind of work? So kind of self-taught on the, the edit side of, of things. Um, and and I, knew, I knew a lot of people who worked for Avid at the time and I'd done some of their trade show stuff. And then I knew people that worked at Adobe and, you know, one of my, my best buddies is now, she's like dragged me across from Avid to Adobe because she's, listen, you're coming, you're coming with me on Premiere Pro. These are going to be your tools. And uh, so I, I know quite a few people in the industry, so that really helped. Um, and it was just about building relationships, really. And it's, it's always been about building those relationships. But yeah, the aha moment was kind of, hang on a minute, your presenting career is going to stall. I've got a friend of mine that always says, I'm going to go back to it. And I think part of what we're doing for our marketing now is going, huh, has anybody in the company got presenting skills and could maybe do some kind of salesy videos or, you know, some adding some value. So um, yeah, set this lot up and um starting with the podcast then we'll start to record some other stuff but yeah it was basically end of end of presenting career for for a time and actually i did enjoy the whole putting together the nitty-gritty of how things worked and 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 working on an edit but for a long time it was it was me it was just me um and then it was bringing editors on editors with the foot i always outsourced edit editing actually from an, an early time when i realized yeah you've taught yourself how to do this but someone else can do it a hell of a lot quicker I think a lot of um, video production companies are small. You know, they're, they're one-man mm -hmm. bands who work out of a granny flat or a spare room or a shed. Um, and then it, you can get so far, um, but to really scale, to really make proper money, you've got to start um, hiring team, putting systems in place. And that can be quite a, a scary prospect. And I know you've just gone through that process in the last two years. So give, given where you are today in the last two or three years, how is that, how has your journey changed as a video production or a video producer? Um, Cause I know you could do bits of it and you've always been quite good at hiring people in, but you know, you've now got a studio, a couple of full timers. Um, to, I'm, I'm sure a few people watching this or listening to this would be like, God, it just seems terrifying that prospect of like moving out of the, the granny flat or the or the shed at the end of the garden into yeah. an office and then hiring people like it talk, talk me about through that journey and how how that evolved for you yeah i mean it's it is a head scramble isn't it and uh for a lot of people and and, and it's um you know having someone like yourself and people uh, you know and the mastermind of the vba is really helpful because you're hearing that 
everybody go through those different journeys and where, where they are. And for me, I think I was kind of always half a step there anyway, because I was already outsourcing the editing stuff. So I'd generally go on shoots or do shoots. Uh, and a lot of the stuff we used to do was run and gun events and, and whatnot. Uh, and then it would get passed on to an editor anyway. And then I would work out what was, you know, you know, where, where it went from there and what they were doing right. What, what I've kind of always prided myself on is uh, knowing what they should be doing, be it the editor or be it the camera ops or being whatever, knowing that they're better skilled at it than me, but mean, you know, being able to judge if they're doing the right job or they're doing it to the best of their abilities or where they're cutting corners. Um, so never had a problem with outsourcing, but it's that whole thing of going, hang on a minute. If I'm, we, you know, we talk about it a lot. We hear it loads. If, you know, if, if I do that, I earn, I earn more money. And actually in the long run, you don't because you just end up being shackled to the tools and you get to a point where you, you just plateau. And that's kind of what, what happened with me. We got to a place where the revenue was, you know, or it literally just flatlined. It, it was nice. It was great. It worked. It worked. Um, but it was kind of getting a, look, a, a little bit stale. So I think getting your hands off the tools in the first place for that for me was the editor. That's where I saw because loads of video pe uh, people just spend loads of time in the edit and then just get really tied up with it as well. So you might I, I also find, so I might spend way more time on it to try and get it absolutely perfect. And I'm less skilled than that editor anyway. So not only can they do it quicker, because they're more skilled than me, but they could do it quicker because they're more skilled than, than me, but also they can get to that, that end result quicker. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, what, what was the turning point for you where you made a decision to, you know, because I mentioned the granny flat, because for, for a period there, you were running your business out of the granny flat at the end of the garden. I used yeah. to run my business out of a shed at the end of the garden. Why did you decide to get an office, build a studio, and then start hiring people. What, what was the catalyst for that? I think because you can't. So I'd done this before. So we're based in uh, we're based in a, a Hertfordshire, in a, a little town called Berkhamsted, a little market town. So we're, we're a commuter town into, into London, and uh, this is where we are. So this is where the office is. I, I used to work in, in a in a pod, so in a garden pod, uh, in when we lived in London. So that was the end end of the garden. That worked really well. And I, I guess the answer is I was comfortable there. Uh, and then when we moved, we, you know, we moved out of London and um, we were working out a bedroom in the house. Then we moved out into an office. And then at some point that office just became a dumping ground for kit. And I just kind of looked around and went, why am I paying an overhead for this? When, and this is, this is pre pre pandemic, way pre pandemic. We were already working remotely anyway, because I was in all my editor contacts were, were lived in London anyway and didn't want to come out to work Hampstead. So we'd, we, we'd already organised how to work remotely. So we're kind of a, ahead of the curve on that. Um, but it just became, I really wanted to separate, bits. sorry, so we, we, yes, we dumped that office. We went, built the granny flat, part office, part granny flat. And then um, it got to the point where actually the commute's nice because it's 18 steps from door to door. But it's, and it worked well during a pandemic way, the kids needed to be around and everything, but it got to the point where I, was, I need this to be separate. If we're going to get serious about it and we're going to build something, I need it to be completely separate uh, from home and, and work life. But also uh, to have a studio and it was, uh, a, there's a, a little element, shouldn't really admit it, of, you know, build it and they will come. Um, and, th and thankfully they are. Um, but it was wanting to have a space uh, to be able to uh, have the camera in there to be able to also to go in there and record our own stuff and then we've got this product to, of course called uh, i say of course uh, for those that know uh, called clearboard so it's a forward-facing whiteboard it's basically a six foot by eight foot piece of glass uh, that you stand behind and you, you write on and you can keep direct eye contact uh, with the viewer so that was one of the other reasons for coming here because you can't really have a six foot by eight foot piece of glass in your granny flat and still have somewhere for granny to sleep. Yeah, no, and it's really interesting because I think a lot of myself included, you know, we've we built studios and, and there's definitely an element of build it and they will come. Um, but I think what's, what's unique about what you've done is you have a unique product offering. And I think this, this moves nicely into the whole idea of you know, I talk a lot about niching and a lot about mm -hmm. focusing energy on one thing. And 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 
probably, I mean, maybe you've had this resistance as well. Sometimes there's a resistance to niching because people feel like if they niche, they're going to somehow miss out on work. But actually what you've ended up doing by def by kind of accident almost is niching in the training and education space for which you use the Clearboard tool. But actually the, the building of the studios ended up giving you an opportunity to, to, to go even deeper into that world. So talk to me about your journey with niching and what your own resistance was. And because I, I think for a while you probably resisted or weren't really focused on a niche. You were like, well, we can do this and we can do the next thing and whatnot. But I, I feel like watching your journey over the last two years, you hit a really big contract in the training and education space and corporate, corporate training, consulting. And I, I feel like you're now more comfortable moving into that, that area. Is, is that the case or, or, or is it something else? Yeah, so I don't think, no, I think you're right. I don't think it was so much a resistance to niche. I think it was just a like, what is my niche? I, I, I don't, it's that kind of imposter syndrome as well, where you're like, oh, well, am, am I good at this? Am I, am I actually a market leader at it? Am I, uh, oh, I don't know. So maybe I should do all these things. The other thing is that thing of going, well, if someone's going to pay you to do an animated explainer video, then we, we might as well do it. But actually that was one of the first things to come off at our offering because to me they're a complete pain in the ass because i don't understand uh the motion graphics side of things well enough to be able to kind of keep an eye on things I was always relying on on someone uh it was kind of felt like something that i couldn't really go well has, has that taken three days to do that or why is, is it is that not a quicker fix is it so um but we uh but going back to the niche it was it was time and working out exactly not just what we did best, but what we want to do and what we enjoy doing. And we've been talking a lot recently about what, you know, where's the most pain and what hiring to, to cover that pain and actually just letting go of those jobs. Is that pain being either it being a bottleneck or not being able to progress, but also pain has been, I just don't like doing that anymore. And for quite a few people, it's don't like editing anymore, don't like shooting anymore. I'm not bothered about either of those, but I, you know, I love going on the shoots and being there with the clients and chatting to them. And that's generally where we, we end up with more business from. So we kind of took a look at the niche and actually we've, uh, by the time this goes out, the new website will be live and it is, uh, it's an 80% done website. It's, you know, uh, done is better than perfect. And then we're going to tweak as we go. But that now, when you look at the, uh, when you look at the navigation bar, the header on the website, there's a Chuff Productions logo in the middle. And on one side, it says marketing videos. And on the other side, it says training videos. Nice. Then it says contact us. There's nothing else on there. Everything else is down. If you want to find out more about us, if you want to look at our case studies, that's all down in the footer. It's out of the way. It literally just speaks to our market, which is we do marketing and training videos for brand and businesses. So I think once I cut, and that's developed quite a bit, that used to be high quality training videos for brand and businesses that get you results that blah, blah, blah. And I think we've all talked about getting it just down to that, that one line. Um, yeah. So that's our kind of headline, our H1 on, on the website. So then the niches, we, we effectively, I'm still not fully niched, but we're on two verticals, marketing and training videos. Yeah. And on the marketing side of things, because the training videos is 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 based on the clearboard things and self paced learning videos. The marketing side of things, so that's where you go. Oh well, I, you know, explainers are marketing videos, but we've narrowed it down for us, which is talking head videos, because that kind of covers anything with a talking head. And we want to push people towards the studio and pointing because it's behind the wall. Um, but also, so talking head videos, testimonial videos, because that's all we used to do. So actually, I found we kind of that we were niching when we very first started, just didn't know it, didn't know what a niche was. So testimonial uh, videos, training videos and brand videos is, is essentially what the offer is in in the marketing side of things. Um, so and then as soon as you realize that and when someone comes in and says, oh, do you do animated explainer videos? No. But I know. Yeah. A man and or that's a woman really key. That, that is the key, um, you know, I work with a lot of businesses, maybe, currently maybe 50, 60 businesses I'm working at the, the moment. And the ones that I see hitting big numbers and not killing themselves are the ones that say no to the wrong jobs. And I think that's a really important point. And it, and it really is a turning point in a video business when you, when you know where your strengths are 
and you say no to things that aren't in your lane. I think video production, and I think it's a hangover from freelance, are like, we can do it, so we'll say yes, because it's work, and we've got, you know, any work's better than no work. But it is counterintuitive to say no to things that are not in your lane. But when you say no to things that aren't in your lane, the focus goes far more into the areas you are specialist in, and, and I really believe where the focus goes, the money flows. And it, it but it takes balls to start with. In, yeah, uh, not, it's not easy. Heat, to, you know, but it's, it's uh, what I, I, you know, I say it takes balls in the sense of it's scary. It can be scary if you've not got uh, a, a, a regular income or a, a regular client. And we're all working towards building bigger, bigger and better relationships with our current clients because you know they're they're the easiest people to market to but also i've got great relationships with nearly all my clients and uh and if i haven't got a great relationship with them they're not going to be a client for very long because it's not it doesn't sit in our wheelhouse it's not kind of what we want but that first step of saying no and actually that was probably only 18 months ago when we started doing that and uh or to the odd job and then 12 months ago when we started doing that totally and I, i've said said to a couple of members of the team um uh, one who's on maternity now is is, is oh well, what we're we doing this i've said no it's not a right fit client they i, I can see it I, I can see it a mile off they will be an absolute pain in the backside and there's only one or two clients that we work with that we know are a pain in the backside but in a in a nice way and they get stupid taxed so they they uh, in the, not calling them stupid, but uh, one of our favorite favorite books, A Road Less Stupid, by Keith J. Cunning, which you talk about a lot, uh, is you know if someone is going to cause you a bit of pain and take longer, to, and it's always the same, isn't it, on edits? So we yeah. just want to tweak this, and we just want to change that, or everyone's done the full round of uh, you know you've got that consolidated feedback, but then we've shown it to the CEO, or then we've shown it to the head of marketing, they want to change this and change that. Yeah. So there's a couple of clients that I've got. I know it's going to take longer, and we charge them more, and they know. Yeah, you've got to charge a premium, know, and it's it's a very honest uh, it's it's a very honest conversation with them now as well. It's like, look, you do know for anybody else, this would be a bit less money, or in some cases, a lot less money. But you're going to have us round the houses. Yeah. So that, and I think that's something else that's really, really important. It's like honesty. Like having difficult conversations or conversations that are not going to be comfortable for you, but if you're honest with the client up front, everything runs more smoothly. And I and I and I think that that is something that you you learn with experience. That the only policy you should deploy in your business is complete and utter honesty and transparency. You don't need to to hide anything. You just say to the client, like as you said, this we're charging you more for this because we know we're going to go around running around the houses. The chances yeah. are they know that and they'll be like, yeah, that's fine. I don't think when you have really good relationships with your clients, anyone expects you to do stuff for free or be out of pocket. It doesn't make any sense. And it's something that I always want to instill in people I work with is like truly value what you're doing. And sometimes that value can change over time. And it does because, you know, what you're doing at Chuffed is more valuable than where it was two years ago. Because yeah. you have a team, you have resources, you've just brought in a new editor, you're improving your output at cost to you. And therefore, you should increase your rates to your clients because you're now offering a more polished service. Um, I, uh, I just got an, an email from Google. Uh, and we've got like five or six Google accounts. And just an email just saying, there's, there's going to be a price change on February the 10th. Yeah. You know, Google Workspace and Business plus for stopacademy.com price changes on february the 10th it's yeah. not they don't ask you permission they just go we're changing it here's a new price and what do we do we go okay and i think i think pricing and i i hear this a lot from from filmmakers because i talk to a lot of people and a lot of times i hear this undercurrent of i don't want to seem like i'm taking a piss i don't want to seem like i'm being greedy i don't want to seem like and 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 that's something, and I know you, you come from a, a your dad was a, a restaurateur and, and you got a lot of great knowledge and experience through the way he ran his business. But something you said to me was, um, you know, you, you're, I think your, your mum had said to one of the kids, oh, look, you know, all you need to do is, is, is work hard and you'll get everything you need. 
and you stepped in and went, actually, mum, no. I think that older generation were all about if you work hard, you get paid well. Modern business, I think, is about working smart, providing a ton of value and, and, be, and providing a pricing structure that is going to enable you to have the lifestyle you want and pay everyone that works for you. And I'd love to get your thoughts on that because you obviously you've told me stories about your dad and yeah. and how he ran that restaurant and, and your mum and how, how hard they worked and how, how much of that has influenced how you now run your business. It's influenced a lot. I mean, uh, so so my dad passed away the uh, middle of the pandemic, uh, not pandemic connected. And mom, uh, they retired about five years ago, kind of worked right up until the very end. And they, they ran a very successful business, a banqueting business in uh, in the People's Republic of South Yorkshire in Sheffield. And, uh, you know, he was a big character and really, really well known there. And um, yeah, but they, but they worked hard. They worked bloody hard and they just kept working hard right to the end. And it's what, but it's kind of what they became and what they were. My mum still misses work now and she'd rather, you know, she'd rather be at work and, and <clears throat> yeah, with one of the kids, it was like, oh, you work hard, you get everything. And I'm like, no, yes, you work hard, but at some point that changes to working smart. Yeah. I, you definitely need to work hard, but it's work in, 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 in the right areas and then turn it into smart. Cause there's no point in busting a gut 14, 16, 18 hours a day, five, six, you know, sometimes seven days a week. Cause what then have you got to show for it other than, you know, tired feet? <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Restaurant. And, 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 and what, what do you, why do you think, that, that so many, maybe, I, would, I don't want to say younger filmmakers, but f filmmakers and business owners who are maybe at the smaller end of the scale, what do you think it is that stops them from scaling up? Why do you think they get, they're so afraid of success? Because I, I think there's a, a secondary pandemic in the, where the video world where a, a lot of people are afraid of success. They're afraid to invest. They're afraid to step into the discomfort of having a plan and really working to that plan. Because I, I really believe, that, I mean, we, we work with businesses in, in the VBA. We were on a call the other day and people were sharing their revenues. And like, I would say the average revenue of members of the VBA is in sort of Aussie dollars sense, it was like 400, 600, 800 thousand dollars, which is like yeah. 200, 300, 400 thousand pounds equivalent. Yeah. That is the that is the norm. Anywhere from 200 to 400 thousand pounds a year and these are businesses with one or two employees um, and, and the goal is to get over the half a million uh, because that, that seems to be a sweet spot whereby with 30 or 40 clients, maybe 50 clients across the year, team of two or three, you can be pulling a good um, 150, 200 grand net a year yeah. Um, yeah. Without, without working crazy hours. So yeah. What what are your thoughts on that? Why is it that in the VBA that seems to be the, like a kind of a really mindset. healthy like mindset? Yeah, it's mindset, and it's like you, people go mindset. What's like if you'd said mindset to me sort of three years ago at a game? Yeah, it's set. What what do you want me to do with it? Mm. <laughs> and it's like actually no no. You, what what getting yourself in the right headspace, zooming out, looking at the bigger picture, which again is not easy and it can feel uncomfortable. And, uh, but then also setting course, so whether it's setting a target, uh, whether it's a revenue target, a profit, new ta profit target or number of clients or whatever that target might be and aiming for it and going for it. And then as you go, as we talk about adjusting course on the way, and that might change, you might be heading the wrong direction. You might suddenly find actually something over here, but rather than just going, oh, I'm just going to wander off over you. Yeah, you sit, yeah, you yeah, think yeah. and go, actually is over there the right place. But it is mindset about, um, how you approach your business, how you approach your clients, how you approach your colleagues, how you approach your, your staff or your freelancers. Um, it's about knowing you, your own value as well. Um, but as we've talked about loads and a big thing for me, and I've just thought basically spent the whole of January is what does success look like to you? So I think- it, And oh, revisiting that every year. Yeah. Because every, well, what's ex you get to a quarter, goal that you set yourself and then suddenly that doesn't seem like such a big goal anymore. So yesterday uh, is a great example of that. And we, we've been, we've obviously had a massive month of planning in, in the VBA yesterday, uh, sat down in a conference room in a hotel 
with uh, for the Chuffed Productions AGM uh, and Marital AGM with my wife. And the pair of us sat there because she's a part of the business. And actually, most of it was we can actually talk without being interrupted by the kids. And yeah. it was like, for us, we've decided it's the year of the house. So uh, like a lot of things in my business, in my house, things are 80% done. So it's about yeah. getting those finished. And we're basically brain dumped whole list of things we want to do at home but then also we looked at and it's the first time i've really shared with her revenue targets uh profit mock targets for the next few years and the, that sort of three five and, and ten year plan and we haven't mapped out where we want to be in three five and ten years but we've put figures to it and that will do do us for now and actually halfway through the day i was like uh we we went through the we went through the calendar so q1 calendar just just going is there any places you are where i need to pick the kids up you know just yeah. things like it seems mad it's like you what you need to sit in a conference room with your wife to work that out and it's like that's a great actually, idea sometimes you do just to get ahead of the game and go and there were there are a couple of conflicts uh because she works in sports pr so some stuff she's going to be doing at the weekend and doing other stuff and it's like oh hang on a minute I need to be, I, I can't be anywhere. I've got two, you know, two trips this month, but I need to make sure I'm back in time for this and blah, 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 blah. But anyway, halfway through that, I was like, we should do this every quarter. Yes. So That's a great I've, already idea. Booked, I've already booked it for uh, last week in March. So that that look, then we then look to Q2 or which will be, you know, Q2 of the-, the What you should do uh, is get granny down for the weekend do it on a Friday and well, Saturday and go and stay in a very nice hotel and have dinner as well. well. This, was, this, Dennis, as you know, oh, you know me well. This was the plan, but guess what? Someone got poorly. Yeah. Uh, so it was, uh, well, actually, it was a it was a bad time to book it. We were going to do it second week in, in January, but it just, having been away for Christmas and stuff, it was always like, Ugh. but no, that's exactly what, what we're going to do. Um, yeah. And that, you know, again, that probably wouldn't have done that two years, three years ago. But all and, and I'm curious, in, you know, because yeah. Mrs. Baldwin obviously is part of the business, but she's not in yes. the day to day operation. She she sees yeah. you doing stuff with me. I've met her a couple of times. We yeah. she knows what's going on sort of piecemeal like yeah. both of wives do. But what was her impression when you shared with her? where you've got to this year and the journey you've been on and and where you wanted to go next did she comment or observe any shifts in you and and, and that mindset we were talking about in terms of is is it expanding further well we've got some ambitious targets for the next three years which we're talking about on the call this this uh, uh this week and i was a bit like i wonder what her reaction is going to be to be like really do you think and she looked just looked at next year's target and went yeah you can do that um, and and the big thing for that is I think as we've we've talked about you and I loads in the group and and are kind of offline of that what does success success look like to you and for me it's not about doing five days a week because my kids are six and four so it's about spending time with them so I don't want to work five days a week uh, yeah. the target this year is to take which is to take every half term off which I'm I'm doing. Uh, nearly all of Easter and three, three or four, I'm aiming for four weeks out of the six weeks holiday. So it's all about yeah. family. And then it changes up a little bit for us in September because they're both then at school age. So that was also a discussion with where does she want, what does she want to be doing? Because she left her full time job when our second child came because she wanted to be the one that took them to school and picked them up from school and didn't yeah. do that. So yeah, her reaction was brilliant because she was like, yeah, great. And it just, it just gets you on the same page. And then that what will happen in, in time is that will not only will it be a marital and company AGM, uh, if anyone's married, honestly, do a marital AGM. It's it's I love it's, it. Yeah, I was I was we just both came out smiling, going, wow, that was brilliant. We're on the same page. Um yeah. and then uh, but that will turn into a um attraction. Uh so Gino Whitman traction, anyone who's read that, that will turn into that kind of um level 10 meeting and uh 90 day planning and all, all, all that kind of stuff eventually when as as yeah. the team grows but again i don't want to grow to a to a huge massive team i've got a that's the thing i'm spending a bit of time on at the moment thinking about what that team wants to look like for the revenue target that we're going for and 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 the, and, and the profit and i think you know this if I, the more i think about it there's there's like quite a common theme inside the vba of mostly men with young families who 
who actually want to be around to watch the kids grow up. Andrew yeah. over in Sydney is like, my, my absolute non-negotiable is I take my son to school every day, I pick him up from school every day. And he's someone running almost a million dollar business um, with a team of two full-timers. And that's what's exciting mm -hmm. is that it, it is very possible and very predictably doable to generate a personal income of a couple of hundred thousand pounds a year or four hundred thousand dollars a year, which is, you know, about five percent of the population take that money can you're talking lawyers and consultant doctor earnings making videos, except you're not making the videos. And I think this is the thing that I feel my mission is is evolving to. I wanna help more families have a kind of really successful financial stable future but without having to kill themselves on shoots yeah. and that is i think what we've managed to evolve in the programs that we work with because i see the same patterns and if you if you think about the people in the vba i mean everyone's having a really nice life earning good money without working crazy hours yeah and again that comes to i think down to two things is mindset so what, where we talk about mindset and all you know about being working uh on the company not in the company um which i've got a great little thing i'll tell you about in a second but the, but again it's that no knowing what success means to you so success for everyone might not be five hundred thousand. it might not be a million quid it might be whatever it is that pot of money that that, that makes you uh, uh live the life that you've become accustomed to and so other people are more ambitious and there's there's in the vba there's you know you'll find someone that's similar to me or similar to someone else there's all there's, there's those different views and that's the great thing about a mastermind is that you hear those different views and you share those different stories and uh and different methods of, of getting places and going there as well so I, I did an interview with uh a, a client who has got a multi-million pound global business and he was the chairman and he's stepped he stepped away from it now um but he was uh, they're, they're, they're doing they're doing some we're doing a brand video for them and he's he's still involved in the business so but um, as an aside uh, we asked him oh you, when you first started how did you you know what did you do and what did did you read books or what was it and uh, I said this guy's in his in his seventies but what thirty years ago when he when he started this business having been in corporate guess what the first book he read was I wouldn't have a clue E Myth. Michael wow. E. Gerber. Wow. And it's like, it's, and it's so this guy's got multi million pound business, and you kind of go, hang on, that's the one book that, and I said to him, it's still the book that everyone, yeah. it's the first book that everyone reads. It's probably the first yeah. book that, that proper business book that I read. I know that you read and where it yeah. goes. And I think that's the other thing about being a, being a, I'm off on a tangent here, Dennis, but um, that's the other thing about being in a mastermind is sharing those things. So yeah. people go, oh, what, what mastermind? What, what is it? And it's basically, it's a bunch of people in a room or a virtual room, sharing ideas, sharing experiences. And for a lot of the time, um, it saves you time because someone might've had an experience with something and go, don't bother with that because it's not going to quite work or go and try it for yourself, but I don't think it's quite right for you. Now that might be using Basecamp or using Asana or uh, using Monday.com, whatever it is for your, for your project management thing. But also uh, loads of us big into reading our books. I'm going for 52 this year. Um, so it's uh, what Chris said the other week, what should I read next? And I think yeah. three of us all went the one thing. Yeah, and it's like, uh, and then it's what should I do after that? Oh well, try traction. You're probably not ready for it yet, but it's like it's so yeah, instead yeah. of having to go, oh, should I spend time reading this book? And it's shortcutting. The other thing is shortcutting. Yeah. So uh, because you've got that many people in there, and we share things. I've shared my template for Asana projects with a couple of the members this week, or we've shared uh, contract templates, things like that. Just anything that can help each other. It's a very open place where you can exchange ideas but also exchange resources that help each other just climb that ladder faster yeah no it's very cool i think one of the things that i, I come across is uh, when when filmmakers are um and videographers are looking to try and build their business get more clients they they get 
caught up sometimes in the tactics and the weeds of like, well, I want to go and pay an SEO agency so I rank higher or I'm going to pay a social media person to create more posts or I'll, I'll just need to make more posts. And I think the thing that's always where, where the, the mastermind comes into play is someone can come in and go, well, I was thinking about doing this. And then a bunch of people just go, don't even waste your time. Do this instead. And usually the thing that you should be doing is a little bit uncomfortable. And we had a call this week where there was a little bit of discomfort. Mm. And I think one of the things that I do um, consciously is sometimes create a level of discomfort to 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 see the opportunity for growth. And, um, and, and almost every time we do it, there might be a moment of discomfort. But even then, the, that element of discomfort is I don't find that uncomfortable because I know when there's a discomfort in the room, it means people are going to have breakthroughs. And almost every time that happens, someone comes up to me afterwards and goes, you know what, that was a little bit weird or a bit uncomfortable. Hmm. But I thought about it now, and now I think I can do this. And that to me is like the coolest thing about a mastermind is stretching people's own yeah. belief systems because we all get comfortable. We get to a point where, look, if you're a freelancer, right, and you're making 70 to 100 grand a year, that's a great income. But with a business, you could turn it into three or four hundred thousand pounds a year and work less. So, what do you want to do? And and you can learn the skills of looking after people and working with a team. You can learn the skills of marketing and systems and, and funnels and and all that marketing stuff. And um, you know, you, you're not born learning. You don't. You're not born knowing how to ride a bike. It can be learned. And I think that, especially in video production. It, it's a young man's game, a young woman's game. You know, you get to a point where you just don't want to lug cameras around anymore. I was having this conversation with someone the other day. I said, I used to sleep, eat, breathe, shooting, lighting, loved it. I couldn't imagine going on a shoot now. Wouldn't, wouldn't really be interested. Because that, I'm much more interested in working with other humans and, and coming up with ways to hack mindset and play a bigger game and, and watching someone go from... I want to make 300,000 this year to maybe I could make half a million. If we, and then we can go, well, if we tweak this, this, and this, that's absolutely possible if you focus on it. And I think that's where I get a lot of a kick um, is watching that journey. I think a couple of things to pull out from that are, are that, uh, and it kind of goes, it goes back to, um, you know, what, where do you start and how, how did you get involved and uh, how do you move towards scale and what's, you know, what was the thing? And it's, we don't know. Loads of video production people don't know. They don't know how to run a business. I, I didn't know how to run a business. I'd seen my parents run a business. My brother runs a very successful business, but I've not been in it. And in the nitty gritty, or I was with my parents early doors, um, but you know, I've not been in the nitty gritty of it. And the whole thing about having a market marketing plan and a lead magnet and a this and a, a you know, and you, you learn it as you go along. So that's why I was saying about shortcutting things, because if you can get there quicker and you can accelerate your learning ooh, in a video business accelerator, then that's that's the way, you know, that's the, the, the uh, surely that's going to be a benefit to you because you can get there quicker. So, but some people don't realize that that's kind of what they want to do. We've had a, com we, you know, we've had people in the VBA where, where we've said to them, or you've said to them, but others have said as well is, well, if you really, really like editing, if you're telling us that's what you really love doing, that's your passion, then go and be an editor. Don't, don't be, don't run a video production business. Yeah. Cause it's not for everyone. You, it's hard. No. If, if you're a colorist, if that's your thing, then do that or find someone who wants to run a business and, and let them run the business and you be their editor or colorist and, 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 and go from there. Um, can't remember what the other thing was I was going to say. It'll come back to me, I'm sure. So so what does what your kind of next 12 months look like? Next 12 months for me, I've got a uh I've got a stretch goal, a stretch target revenue wise. And our, our profit and revenue, you look back to it, it, it's always pretty much the same. So that I I, you know, people go, oh well, you know, you know, uh turnovers, what vanity, profit is sanity and cash is king. Well, I know that the profit is sanity and i know that it's going to be at the same pretty much margin all the way through so with that goal in mind it's about uh it's about building and solidifying the, solidifying is that right 
building the team, making the team strong, having the right people on the bus and having them in the right position. And we're getting really close, close to that now. I'm clearer than I've ever been on who I need in this room or in my virtual room, my, my company and what position I need them in for us to go to the next, le next level. But also, as you know, with me, it's about, it's not just about going to the next level, it's about going to the next level, but still having my time because that's what success looks like to me, which is essentially having holidays off and, and being around with the kids while they're at the age they are. Um, so, so yeah, so we, we, conversation yesterday after AGM with someone else we're looking to bring on part-time and then uh, the big thing that I need is, is a project manager and I was chatting to you about this I, I want someone who's not work not doesn't come from a video production background because yeah. we've identified that people who come from video production background for us as a company work well to a certain point but come with a bit of baggage um from those other companies i'm, I'm smiling because my my old man um whenever he employed a new new member of the bar bar staff the bar team we had in his restaurant that this room was called the long room because it was long and he always used to sit the furthest away from the entrance door and he'd say i always know halfway down that halfway down that room i know whether i'm offering him a job or not and it used to drive his beverage manager crazy because he, he guaranteed they'd always got no bar experience whatsoever so we're going to take more training but they were trained in the baldwin's amiga way they were trained in the yeah. david and pauling baldwin way and and what how they did it so i've learned that from them and i think you know it's taken a couple of goes at it but that we know that's what we need to do and then building out the systems but yeah there's a revenue there's a stretch goal revenue target and and it's about building the team and then create keep making that sustainable that's where i was going for not solidified making it sustainable because the one thing that i think i've always struggled with is uh so you're simon cynic what's your why and i've kind of always danced around that and it's like your why can't be money and i'm like really can it not be can it not just be money because i just kind of want money to do nice things and then yeah. you kind of think about what those nice things are and what they are and my purpose is to build a production company that will support my family be that now or be that in the future so if one of the kids wants to come and take it over then that's great or if it's someone else that's running it for me in the future and, and i'm taking a, you know a nice wage and a nice dividend then that's great so then the problem with that is that doesn't really translate to any of your employees hey guys we're all working towards building this company to so that ben's kids have got something and that ben can whatever so then we sat down and thought about that it's like actually we're building a company for the right people that are the right cultural fit that uh can help and help their family and build a solid foundation for them and they can grow and they can eventually maybe there's a revenue share in here there's a profit yeah, share or nice. something in it. who knows there's there's a blank sheet and i think that's something that i've realized over the last couple of months and that's helped me set course to where to where i'm going next i i think there's definitely a feeling on a culture of holistic approach to business inside the mm. communities that we we're involved in um which i think is really exciting because i think the world has changed in the last couple of years business can't be done the same way um the byproduct of creating great value for your clients is financial reward and and if you set your eyes on a financial goal and you build the right infrastructure and you look at how you're going to you know transact a service then it, it's very doable but you can do that with a lot of um, cultural fit with your clients, with your, with your team. And, and it becomes a joyful thing to do. You know, it doesn't feel like work. And I think that's where I've gotten to with the work I'm doing now. I feel like we've, we've put a lot of work into the last three or four years to get it just right and get it to, to really cook. And now I just get a lot of pleasure from doing it because I, I, I have, this, there's a great culture and, and, and you're a huge part of that culture. And, and actually when, when a new member joins, it's like, they've got to fit into the culture although they usually don't get in if they're not going to be a cultural fit because we, mm. we have a kind of quite a strength a strict process yeah but um that, that that idea of culture is something that i know we've talked about before so i think what you're saying is your culture is now being solidified so everyone feels like they're on the right bus yeah definitely so it's say it it, it is uh demonstrating what that that culture and what those values are 
to any newcomer into the business as well. And I heard a, a great one the other day was, look, you can write mission statements. Uh, that's all very well and good. You can write your, your brand guidelines, your brand values, or you can write a culture statement, but actually you could boil all that down into one statement and it is a, a statement of intent that would cover everything. Because I think a lot of people, what can scare people off when you get to this kind of level in business or this this level of business, this kind of thought in business is, oh, well, hang on, so I've got to really think about the culture, I've got to really think, and actually, your, your culture might be three lines. Your values might be three lines. People say five to seven. So your first thing you do is Google oh, examples of brand values. And, you know, you've got Coca-Colas or you've got, uh, you know, some banks or whatever it is. But actually, you just think of three things that, that, that are about you and what it is. And, you know, for us, it's family first and it's holding to each other to account. And it's having fun while we do things and making sure the client get, gets a premium product. That's I kind mean, of, stick, kind of stick that on the wall, you know, that that's going to resonate. We're all recording this, aren't we? I need to write else. that down. Yeah, you can go back and that, 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 that to me seems like three amazing values. Yeah. Yeah. So that, you awesome, know, that's ben. something we're working on at the minute, just to, just to really solidify, but it doesn't need to be hard work. I think that's the thing. I know there's going to be people listening to this out there that are like me that think, oh God, that sounds like hard work. It is, it can be. Uh, but there are shortcuts and it, it doesn't need to be complicated. You can literally yeah. just, you've just got to get off your backside and do it. And as the sign know, behind me says that. it, JFDI. JFDI. For anyone listening to exactly. that, it's just related to the idea of doing something. Just yes. effing do it. Just effing Ben, do I'm it. so glad we got to have this conversation. I hope it's yes. been of value to the listeners and viewers. Guys, let us know in the comments if it resonated with you. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll do this again in another year and see where where you are then. That's almost like a coaching thing there, Dan, holding me to account to see if I've hit my revenue wow. target. Let's do that, shall we? <laughs>